OK, carrying on with our look at individualistic theories of crime, we're now going to move on to learning theories, and in particular that of Albert Bandura. At the same time, we'll evaluate his theory and look at how it may have informed policy. So just a recap, individualistic theories of crime hold the our individual differences based on our personality type, our experiences, um, shape us, shape our personalities, and they would therefore argue that the root of crime is in our psychological makeup and the development processes we've experienced from childhood through to adulthood. So as I've said before, we're going to look at social learning theory, which is that of Albert Bandura. And learning theories are based on the assumption that offending criminality is a set of behaviours that are learned in some way, just the same way as all our other behaviours. So criminality is a result of learned behaviours and usually that's from family and peers. So Albert Bandura died this year, I'm doing this in 2021, June 2021 I think he died, we're now in November. His key ideas, um, well, he thought that learning occurs, we learn by observing and imitating others. It's very much this idea of monkey see, monkey do. So there's a classic example of a child imitating the people walking in front. So we learn through modelling. Modelling involves learning by watching other people who are the models and we then lead that we then imitate them and so we repeat their behavior so just as this boy is repeating his dad shaving learning to shave or this monkey watches the man stick his tongue out and then copies by sticking the tongue out there so monkey see monkey do and this all then links down to role models and some key terms here identification and that refers to the extent to which someone relates to a model and feels that he or she is similar to that person and a person becomes a role model if they're seen to possess similar characteristics to the observer usually the role model is of the same sex identification with a model means the individual is more likely to imitate their behavior so if you identify with the person we're more likely to copy them imitate them be like them and role models are also much more likely to be imitated if they're attractive and they have high status so going back to my youth i was very into and still am into a band called the smiths these four people and when they were about in the early 80s Fans would copy the way they dressed, copied the hairstyles. Um, the Smiths used to have a lot of time with um, waving flowers about on stage. And as you can see, these fans have all got flowers ready to go to the concert. And it was mass hysteria. Um, here we've got the fans at a Smiths gig. So for a long time, lead singer of the band was my role model. I even started to have my hair slightly like him. But there you go imitation, role model, someone that struck home to you. So there are different types of role model that we can imitate. There are live models. So those are people that are physically present in our environment. And that might be a mother, a teacher, a pop star. Uh, so mother here, Marcus Rashford over here, very good role model. Um, Taylor Swift is seen by many people as a good role model. Um, then we have symbolic models, and that's people in films or books, cartoons, so fictional characters. And I suppose, you know, Harry Potter, Ron Weasley, Hermione, etc., might be seen as a role model by some people. And symbolic modelling, so fictional characters, is considered to have a much greater effect in cultures where the media is widely available. So if you've got widely available me, um, media, you will get symbolic role models. And this is quite important for when we come looking at things like um, computer games, the influence of videos on criminality, etc. So let's 
get down to social learning theory and Bandura. And his key term is vicarious reinforcement. And this involves learning through observation of the consequences and the actions of other people. So when a learner observes someone, they may identify with, uh, sorry, when the learner observes someone they identify with, and that person, the role model, receives a reward for their behaviour, the person that's watching is much more likely to copy that behaviour themselves. So to give an example, um, here's Beth observing her brother, her brother cleaning up the plates after dinner. Um, and you get, well done for clearing up the plates after dinner, you can have some pocket money. So she sees mother giving her brother pocket money for clearing up the plates. Vicarious reinforcement. Beth realises that if she imitates her brother, who acts as a role model for her, the same will happen to her. So then we get Beth clearing up the plates and well done, says mum, you can have some pocket money. That basically is vicarious reinforcement. However, obviously this can go the other way because if the role model is criminal, then you can end up with criminality. So here I've got a newspaper article that I clipped out. Come to you like Deliveroo, father and son, crack cocaine dealers boasted about delivery service. So these two, crack cocaine dealing father and son, Liam Bolton and son Liam, they've even got the same name. Father and son, crack cocaine dealers offered a delivery service to users boasting they come to you like Deliveroo, a court has heard. Liam Bolton Sr. Liam Bolton Jr. were caught red-handed selling the drug on the streets of Swansea then released un the, and were then released under investigation to court again just a few months later with large stashes of the drug hidden internally. So there you've got Liam emulating the role model of his father and becoming a drug dealer, so hence criminality. So, Bandura's theory all hinges on his famous Bobo doll experiment of 1961. And I've included this YouTube clip, five minutes long, it's from a BBC programme. If you click on that, it will take you through uh, the whole of Bandura's experiment. So those that are watching this on YouTube, you just have to pause, copy the clip, and away you go. It's about five minutes long, it's really good, I thoroughly recommend it. But what Bandura did is he took a sample of 36 boys and 36 girls from Stanford University Nursery School and they were aged between three and six. And he was, like, he was looking to see what happens, how do people imitate role models? And the experiment was conducted in a lab. The children watched a model, which would be the adult, playing with a Bobo doll. And the way they did it was 24 of the children watched the model playing aggressively with the Bobo doll. 24 other children watched the model playing non-aggressively with the, with the Bobo doll and 24 children saw no modelling whatsoever. So that way Bandura was ensuring that he had control groups. Then all the children, including the control group, were subject to, to what Bandura called mild aggression arousal. So in other words, making them feel a little bit annoyed. And what they did was they took each child to a room with some really nice to toys. And as soon as the child started to play with the toys, the experimenter then said, I'm really sorry, these are my very best toys and I'm reserving them for the other children. So you can't play with them. So that straight away, kids are starting to feel a little bit peeved that they can't play with these really nice toys. The children were then taken to a third room, which contained some aggressive toys. So there was a mallet, dark guns, and then this three foot Bobo doll, which looks like this. It's like a clown that you can, um, that, that's got a low center of gravity, so you can hit it and it rocks back. And there are also some non-aggressive toys, like a tea set, some crayons, cuddly toys, a plastic farm animals, etc., etc. And then they watched their behavior through a one-way mirror and as you can see from these photographs the behavior was interesting. So here were the results. The children who had observed the aggressive modeling earlier on when they came to the Bobo doll 
they acted more aggressively towards the doll. This kid here is kicking it, thumping it with a mallet, mallet etc. And they were far more aggressive than the group who had observed the non-aggressive modelling. So those that had watched, had watched aggression towards the Bobo doll acted far more aggressively towards it when they were in a room with it than the non-aggressive modelling and the non-aggressive group. It was also shown that boys imitated more physically aggressive acts than girls. So boys are more aggressive than girls. And this also um, showed that boys were more likely to imitate same sex models than girls because the modelers were of the same sex. So what did this show? Well, Bandura also did a follow up study in 63 and he showed videos to children where an adult behaved aggressively towards the Bobo doll. So it wasn't actually an adult physically doing, it was watching it on a screen. And again, one group of children saw the adult praise for the behaviour, so they were being told, oh, well done. And then a second group saw the adult being punished for their aggression by being told off. And the third group saw aggression without any consequences. And as a result of that, when given the Boba doll to play with, the first group behaved much more aggressively, followed by the third group, and then the second group behaved the least aggressively. So the group that saw the model being told off for the behaviour was less aggressive. They seemed to be um, learning. So as you can see here, this bar chart shows this. Uh, boys and girls with the model rewarded, uh, boys and girls with a model punished and boys and girls no consequences and you can see very different results there completely much lower here with the boys and girls now this then links to some case studies so if we learn by looking and copying there are some studies you can use so i picked two for you um, I would have a look at the case of the murder of James Bolger. Again, I've put a YouTube clip in for you, so you can look at the full case story. Those who are watching this on my channel, you just have to pause and copy the link. But in a nutshell, James Bolger was murdered by two 10-year-old boys uh, named Robert Thompson and John Venables. These are the pictures of them when they were arrested in, 19, in 1993. And they were said to have watched a video called Child's Play 3 just prior to the murder. That is uh, Child's Play 3, an 18 video nasty. Um, and these were 10 year old kids that had watched this film. The judge in summing up at the trial said, it's not for me to pass judgment on their upbringing, but I suspect exposure to violent video films may in part be an explanation. So the judge made that link between watching the, the aggression of violence on Child's Play 3 to what they did um, to Jamie Bolger. And if you watch the YouTube channel, it will tell you exactly what they did. And here you see the two children, uh, the two boys taking Jamie Bolger out of the shopping centre and they lead him off um, onto railway tracks where they ultimately murder him. The other theory, um, the other case you can use is the Columbine school shooting. Um, that's Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. They murdered 12 students and a teacher and wounded 23 others before shooting themselves at a high school in Littleton, Colorado in April 1999. There's a really good documentary by Michael Moore called Bowling for Columbine, uh, which won an Oscar um, back at the turn of this century. It's a fantastic film. Uh, I thoroughly recommend you watching it. Um, but if you want a clip from YouTube on the Columbine killing, uh, that's the one to go for. And uh, they, uh, Harris and Klebold, were known to enjoy playing a game called Doom, which was a game licensed by the US military to train soldiers to kill. And here's a clip from uh, Doom. So that's the sort of thing it looked like, quite an old video game. And that is a clip of Harris and Klebold taken from the school security cameras as they went around the school with semi-automatic weapons shooting the place up. So again, these ideas that by watching something, imitating role models or imitating the model that they're seeing, people copy the behavior and then act out in a criminal way. So what are the strengths of this theory? 
Well, the Bobo Doll experiment, uh, Bobo Doll experiment, uh, where they changed the model's behaviour, aggressive or non-aggressive, and controlled all the other variables. It's a really strong experiment. Um, it really does show that the model, the modelling of behaviour by the adult, had an effect on child's behaviour. It, it shows cause and effect. So it's a strong experiment that holds up well to scrutiny. And it's got real life applications. The results of the research in this area suggest the need to protect children from witnessing aggressive actions. It supports the need for things like the watershed and rating certificates on films and video games. And so that links a little bit through to policy as well in terms of ensuring that we have this in society. And you can add that. I haven't put this in the policy one, but you could use that if you want to. And the study has been replicated with slight changes and similar results have been found. So it shows that Bandura's results are reliable. But there are limitations. And this is a big one. And I've put this into subcategories here because it, it doesn't account for the role of biological processes in the causation of criminal behaviour. So, OK, criminal behaviour that runs in families might not be due to observational learning. It could be down to genetic factors. So we can go back to our uh, biological theories and twin and adoption studies, etc. Or um, Bandura found that boys are often more aggressive than girls. Now that could then be explained by hormonal factors, such as the differences in testosterone levels, you know, higher levels in boys that are linked to aggression, which again, we've looked at in previous uh, PowerPoints. The second criticism you can make is the evidence such as Bandura, because it's based on lab laboratory studies, some children may have worked out the aim of the study and not therefore shown natural behaviour. So it's possible that the children in the study were aware of what was expected of them. Noble in 1975 reports that one child arriving at the laboratory for the experiment said, look, mummy, there's a doll we have to hit. Sort of rather um, skews the results. And this would therefore limit the usefulness of this research in explaining the causes of crime. And two other limitations you could also add to this are that Opportuni opportunistic crimes can't be explained by social learning theory because it doesn't involve someone as seeing someone produce the behaviour first. So therefore, social learning theory can only account for the crimes that we see, such as stealing, which are easily observable rather than crimes perhaps such as murder, which we don't physically see often, unless we argue that we see it on the telly. Um, and just because someone witnesses a crime doesn't mean they'll copy it. There are other factors involved, such as upbringing, personality, etc., which may affect whether or not behaviour is imitated. I mean, for instance, I enjoy watching um, quite dark police dramas um, where people are often killed. Uh, but to my knowledge, I haven't been out and killed someone yet because I've been watching those police dramas. Um, so there are your strengths and weaknesses. Now, for policy, I've gone for uh, the policy of token economies. Now, this again will appear in unit four. And if you want a much more detailed PowerPoint on token economies, you can go to that on this channel and go look at my unit four PowerPoints. There's a whole one on token economies in much more detail. What I've done is trimmed down that PowerPoint just for the purposes of unit two here. So token economy programs are used in, were used and still are used in many prisons to obtain desirable behaviour um, and they're often used in juvenile and, uh, with juvenile and adult offenders and they are a form of behaviour modification so they're linked to this idea of social learning theory and the programme started in the 1960s and uh, given the success of the use of learning theories in changing behaviour so the big study on token economies was done by Hobbs and Holt in 1967, and they conducted the studies which involved delinquent boys. Um, and they wanted to see if a token economy program would change delinquents' behaviour. Uh, so they took a sample, they took 125 delinquent males that were in Alabama Boys Industrial School. Uh, it's a state-run school for delinquents located in an urban area 
and the boys basically resi resided in five independent houses which were called cottage units and the boys were a, um, of an age range between 12 and 15 years and they had multiple charges ranging from truancy to being uncontrollable to arson to homicide so a broad spectrum of crime that they committed and there is uh, one of the cottages and staff in the cottages agreed on a number of target behaviors so this is what they wanted the the boys to do as a result of this um, this trial they wanted them to follow rules in group games they wanted to complete all chores that they were set they wanted them to follow the cottage rules they wanted them in they wanted them to interact with peers and they wanted them to walk in straight lines and follow instructions etc and then they collected the data and basically what they did the boys names were listed on a daily behavior chart and the cottage supervisor marched, it marked each behavioural category. And the boys were told that the staff were taking records and signs were posted listing the expectations of the boys. And basically each boy in each cottage was rated on each target behaviour by two staff members. So each day the supervisor would count the tokens that each boy had earned. And the boys went to a token economy store weekly and they could exchange their tokens for a variety of reinforcers, the things they wanted, which could be drinks or sweets or games or cigarettes, or they could save the tokens up, bank them and exchange them for more expensive reinforcers such as trips or going home. And of course they did a control here. It was introduced in three of the cottages and then in a fourth cottage, they didn't do it at all. So they could therefore compare the three cottages where they were doing a token economy with the one where it wasn't. And the results were startling. They collected the data over 14 months, so it was a long period of time. And the token economy scheme resulted in an increase in the mean percentage of appropriate target behaviours for each cottage with no noticeable improvement in the comparison cottage. So the one where they weren't doing it, no improvement in behavior whatsoever. In cottage A, appropriate behavior increased from, it was at 66%, it went up to 91.6. In cottage B, it was at 46, went up to 80. And in cottage C, 73 up to 94. So dramatic increases in, in behavior that they so it seems to work really well and there are some strengths for this because anyone can administer it with training and tokens and rewards are relatively cheap so the program's not expensive and there are more benefits than costs and token economies where you earn points and you can build up um, rewards are run in most prisons that we have nowadays in some form or another and it's been found to be successful by many studies, although it was also true to say that for 10 to 20 percent of people, token economies just do not work. There's a certain type of person. It will not work. It doesn't matter what you do. Token economies don't work. So you have to accept there's always going to be someone for which it doesn't work. The negatives are that what they found was that token economies worked really well in an institution like a prison but when the young offenders were released or when prisoners were released actually on the outside it didn't work at all because that's not how the outside work work you know outside uh, world works just behaving on, in a normal day-to-day -day scenario obeying the law you don't get rewarded with prizes for being you know a, an average citizen so um some people think that it works very effectively in a prison system but not in the outside world uh, there's recidivism it doesn't work and the programs have to be carefully planned and controlled because there are many uh, problems that could occur such as lack of consistency from staff so that was run in america but in britain and again you've seen this on my presentation on the prison system we use IEPs, incentives and earned privileges. It's effectively a token economy where rewards 
prison is our, our system for sticking to the rules. So you've got three levels, basic, standard, enhanced. Every prisoner starts on enhanced, uh, on standard, and you can earn, work, work your way up to enhanced, or you can work your way down to basic if you don't behave. So basic, prisoners move to the level for refusing to obey rules, they lose privileges, so no TV in the cell, meals are going to be eaten in the cell, etc. If it's standard, your privileges might be able to, you can spend more money than um, each week that they earn. And if you're enhanced, consistently obeying the rules, privileges might include TVs, more visits, more gym time, etc. And you've got this little um, poster that I found, which is uh, a prisoner did to show what benefits you have being on the enhanced system. So if you want to know token economies in depth, look at my PowerPoint in Unit 4. You don't need it in that much depth for Unit 2, but it is an example of how learning theory has informed policy because we use this um, in prisons nowadays effectively. It's not a token economy per se, but it is very much about rewarding appropriate behaviour, so modelling what we want. And you can also use um, the um, age um, distinctions in films and uh, computer games etc. Hope you found that useful, I shall see you soon.